The only reason I said bye to Annalise is taking me like six months to remember her name. Annalise. All right. So yes, uh, for, uh, for visitors here today, I'm Pastor Steve Morgan, United Christian Church. For those watching on Facebook Live, we miss you, we love you, we wish you were here in the Fellowship of Believers, and I am sporting this t-shirt, uh, as you see it's in black and white, that, that's probably representing what I call the audacity of the gospel. This is the audacity of the gospel right here. Jesus said, I'm the way and the truth and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. That's the audacious gospel, that he is the only way. And on July 4th, there are at present 10 churches that will march together as one body of believers. It's a beautiful sight. It's going to be a beautiful sight. It's going to mimic what's going to happen uh, someday when we're all together in this one big church called Jesus. And uh, so uh, on the 4th of July, if you want to sign up for your T-shirts, I will also say this. For those of you who would like to be in the parade... There will be a trailer uh, for those that you, uh, if you don't want to walk the entire trip, you're free to ride on the trailer. There will be a trailer as well because we want everyone to join in in this parade of unity in Christ. All right, so there's my promo for the t-shirt. So for the last three weeks, if anybody's been watching the news, which I am not a big fan of the news media, I watch it rarely. I usually get my news feed off Yahoo and the top four headlines, and I'm done. That's, that's my news feed. But I have paid attention a little bit, because for the last three weeks, a complicated civil war has been rejuvenated in the African country of Sudan. Some of you might be familiar with that. I will mention that Share International, that's our missionary organization that we support, that we have uh, funded in Kenya, we have missionaries on the ground in South Sudan, where this civil war is progressing. Um, there are hundreds of Sudanese who are dead right now. Thousands of Sudanese are injured. Thousands of Americans have fled the country. A hundred thousand uh, Sudanese citizens have left the country. Right now, I believe there are up to 800,000 homelanders are ready to pack up and leave. I think I have an image of that maybe somewhere. I have an image of, yes, there's a single mom feeding her, her kids a meal on their way out of Sudan. Can you imagine someone trying to force you and your family out of your country? That's what's happening in Sudan. Death, hunger, violence, looting, persecution are all creating a scattering of people from their homeland. homeland. Here's why. It's the lust for power. It's power and pride. That's what drives humankind to insanity, is power and pride. And scattering of people is just part of world history. It has been for ages, for centuries. It's a big part of the Jewish national history. They were scattered twice from the Assyrians and the Babylonians. Actually, the scattering of people is a part of our history. We're all spiritual descendants from the Acts 2 church and they will be scattered as well in the face of persecution and in a spirit of hate. To those living in this country today, if you're an American, uh, let me say this. You need to be thankful because over the last 200 years, nobody has come into this country and forced you outside of our borders. Nobody has forced you into Canada or Mexico. We are free be thankful for this democracy. Be thankful for your freedom. And when you get a chance, thank a vet. Thank you, Ray Young, and all the other vets who have served and protect this country. Don't take your freedom lightly. The early church was scattered from the holy city out of hatred and persecution. The death of Stephen, which we talked about last Sunday, coupled with this, I'm called the hysteria, of persecution among the Jews. Hey, they, de Stephen's dead. Let's persecute the whole church. There's this hysteria in the city, and it causes a mass exodus of thousands upon thousands of disciples and followers of Jesus out of Jerusalem. It's too violent. Jesus, our great prophet, the Messiah, he foretold this would happen. Acts 1.8 
you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus predicted this would happen before he ascended. And so persecution actually grows the church, which lends to the statement, God works in mysterious ways. Wouldn't we want the church to grow through potlucks and friendly adventures, which it can, but here the church will grow through persecution and hatred. And this persecution, believe it or not, it will then create a spirit of power. The fleeing refugees who flee Jerusalem in fear for their lives, they are packed with something besides clothing and food. They are packed with that word power, the Greek word dynamis. That means they are packed with dynamite. They are taking the gospel with them wherever they go. Do you take the gospel with you wherever you go? At times, it will take persecution to wake the church up, to stir the church, for the church to be on the move. Sometimes we need a little persecution. I don't want it, but it's true. The blood of Stephen, the first martyr, will cause both salt to be shaken and seed to be scattered in lands outside of Jerusalem. Jesus told every believer here today, you, all of you and me, you are the salt of the earth. You are. You should be flavorful, full of Christ. And I'll say this today. A salty disciple will scatter seed. Have you scattered seed recently? And I'm talking the word of God. So we're going to be Acts chapter 8 today. This is what is called the, the great dispersion of believers, the great scattering after the stoning of Stephen. And I'll mention today that people were not only really scattered as they left, seed was scattered as well. Here we are, Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. On that day, that was the day that Stephen died and said, Lord, forgive them as they kill me. A great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. All except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria, the twelfth day. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. There were still good Jewish people that lived there. Possibly there were Jews that weren't believers yet buried Stephen. And here we go. But Saul. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. And those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. So, church background. Until this time, only the apostles had faced any type of persecution. Peter and John were thrown in jail. Then all 12 were thrown in jail. All 12 were caned and, and whipped at one time. They said, hallelujah, we suffer for Jesus. Now we see deacons. You see the progression? The apostles suffer, now the deacons, and now the common folk are all going to suffer for the name of Jesus. And what happened? The blood of Stephen opened the floodgates of persecution to every member of the church. It would be like if I got, for some reason, I'm leading this church, and I'm making this statement that Jesus is the only way, and our government determines you can't preach that, and now I'm thrown into jail, and I'm suffering, and the government's coming after you. That's what's going on here. Every member of the Acts 2 church is under the threat of arrest or even death. Imagine, guys, if that happened in this country. It has not yet. Church, stand strong. Last Sunday, I mentioned a, a, a missionary named Jim Elliott. Jim Elliott, along with four other missionaries, they're all, all five of them died in a creek bed in, in Ecuador. Jim with 53 spear marks throughout his body. I have an image of Jim, and uh, Jim Elliott's on the right, Nate Saint, the pilot's in the middle, and I believe Ed McCauley's on the left. There's th three of the five, and, and they will use that airplane to reach the lost tribes of the Alcas. And what these five men were doing, simply, is they were scattering seed just to neighbors outside of our continent. They were scattering seed, scattering the gospel that people might come to know Jesus. Now, with that being said, do you know that Jim Elliott 
Can you put his picture up there again? I want you guys, Kim, can you put him up there one more time? Jim Elliott's only 28 years old. Jim Elliott has only been married a couple, three years, and he has a 10-month-old daughter named Valerie. And when some hear that story, they say that mission trip was foolish. It was a senseless tragedy. He should have never went. He should have never went to the Alcas. Senseless. His wife Elizabeth will stay several years later in Ecuador within two years. The men that speared her husband to death will fall on their knees and say, Jesus, I believe and follow. That's the power of the gospel. That's the power of scattering seed. Was his death a waste? Ask him when you get to heaven. He'll say no. Some could say Stephen's death was a waste. That Stephen should have kept quiet. That he shouldn't have spoken the truth about the Pharisees and the religion. Because on the day that Stephen died, he only made it worse for everybody. Right? The fellow disciples, now they're under attack. They were being hunted down. Was Stephen's death a waste? No. His death had eternal ramifications. His blood, yes, the blood of Stephen scattered the church out to the lost tribes outside of Jerusalem. A life lived short, but lived with great purpose. It's far greater than a life lived long than a life lived without purpose, right? The blood of martyrs throughout the history of the church has become the seed of the church. You know, I think of one of the great verses. I, I see Shannon right back there. Hi, Shannon. This is one of Shannon's favorite verses. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. I believe if Stephen would have lived during the, the time of the Apostle Paul, he would have memorized those writings from the Apostle Paul. But he died before Saul was changed, and he only knew Saul the destroyer. So let's talk about people who destroy other people, which Paul was known for. Most historical persecutions have persecuting leaders, don't they? Adolf Hitler and the Nazi regime. Joseph Stalin, he puts Hitler to shame. Pol Pot, the Khmer Rouge, Mao Zedong, all the evils of communism, to name a few. The lead persecutor against the Acts 2 church is a zealous Jew named Saul. He actually believed and prided himself on the premise that he was doing a good work for God Almighty by persecuting and torturing and putting to death this sect of, pe sect of people who follow a false Messiah named Jesus. I'm honoring God with their death. That was Paul's thinking. He will testify to the churches in Galatia. After his conversion, after he meets Jesus on the Damascus Road, after he's on, been on mission trips, he will write these words. You have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God, and I tried to destroy it. That word destroy in the Greek means two things, to wreak havoc and to tear apart. And so what Saul did, like a lion or a tiger or a bear, he ripped at the flesh of the church again and again and again until there's nothing left but bone. That's what he's doing to the church. Relentless. And guys, this was very uncommon of the day, but he's targeting women. He's throwing women in jail along with their husbands. And you know what he's really doing? When he arrests a married couple and they have little ones, Hey, you come with me. Those little Jesus freaks, they can fend for themselves. That's the darkness of Saul. Hopefully, one of the kids is old enough to care for the little ones. That's what's going on in Jerusalem. Do you see why they're fleeing? Perhaps this is why Paul, more than any other New Testament writer, guys, he leans into grace, he promotes grace, he teaches grace, he loves grace because his past was dark and he needed grace to cover it. I don't know who's in here today and your past seems sins 
appear to you to be really dark and you're struggling with what you've done in the past. I'm telling you what today. If you're in Christ, your past sins have no power over the grace of God in Jesus Christ. They have been removed. You are free from them. And God does not look upon you as if you've ever sinned. That's the power of grace. But Saul is a destroyer. He is. And his persecution will scatter not only the church into other regions, it will also scatter the gospel. It almost, it almost works against him. What he wants to contain spreads radically. God's ways are not our ways. So, like those fleeing Sudan today, those refugees fleeing to other lands, the fleeing disciples from Jerusalem, you know what they're taking with them besides their families and foods and sleeping uh, bags and blankets? They're taking the gospel. That's what they're doing. They're adamant that Jesus is the way, the truth, and life. And whether they liked it or not, these refugees have become missional refugees. And guess what? They're going to live in new neighborhoods. So let's talk about your neighborhood. Do you want to? Do you know the average American will move 12 times in their lifetime? I counted that up. I have moved since my birth. I think I'm right, Mom. I have moved 11 times in my lifetime. 11 times in 61 years, I have moved to a new home in a new neighborhood. And my wife's hoping we got one more move and we're going to move to a farm, right? She wants to go to a farm. Lord, let that happen. Now, the question I ask myself, and I'll ask you today, have you been a missional neighbor? And what I mean by that, when you move into a new neighborhood, whether you've been there a year or 20 years, you're still maybe a refugee, a settler, a neighbor. Do your neighbors know who you follow? Now, I've, have, I've seen the flag. I've seen the Cubbies W flag. When I drive into the big city gaze, I have a neighbor down the street that's a big Cubs fan, and I know when the Cubbies win. So you know what? I know that he follows the Cubs. Do your neighbors know that whether you follow the Cubs, whether you follow the Cardinals, whether you're a Lion-Eye fan, a Bears fan, a Packers fan, do they know you follow Jesus? That's a tough one, right? We're called to be missionaries in our own neighborhoods. How do you become a missionary in your own neighborhood? Now, think about that. Now, let's go back to Jim Elliott with that yellow airplane. You know what they did? Their mission work started relationally. That's how we should start, relationally, building relationships. And what they did, that yellow, that yellow piper, they would get over a village of Alcas that they want to meet and speak with, and they would fly that plane around in a circle and circle, and they'd dangle a rope, and eventually that rope would, uh, it would actually stop and hang straight. And they had gifts and trinkets and food and, and knives and machetes. And they offered gifts to the Alcas. And the Alcas, after a time, figured out what was going on. And they would send gifts back up to the plane. They were building relationships thousands of feet above the air, above the ground. And so our mission work has to begin relationally with your neighbor but it has to have a goal that it becomes evangelical. You can talk about the Cardinals and Cubs all you want, but there's going to come a day when you're going to have the opportunity to speak about Jesus. Will you speak his name? Or are you going to keep on about the Cardinals and the Cubs? When that time happens, and pray that it does, have some seed ready. Have John 3, 16 ready. Have your story ready. You need to have seed ready to plant. Now, the scattered church, missional refugees, they're proclaiming the gospel in whatever neighborhood they end up in. And sometimes when we get in these new neighborhoods, and many of us, I've heard you make this comment, well, I wouldn't know what to say, and I don't have enough Bible knowledge, and I don't have enough scripture memorized, and I should know, wouldn't know what to say. Well, some of these missional refugees, they didn't know what to say either. But you do have something to say. You do have enough. If you're being led by the Holy Spirit in your life, you have enough. He indwells you. Jesus told the disciples, this is what's going to happen to you after Pentecost. Do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say 
for it will not be you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Have you ever had that opportunity where you're speaking to someone and the words come out and you're like, where'd that come from? How did I just tell somebody about Jesus? It was the Holy Spirit. So I'm telling you today, whether you have zero verses memorized or little Bible knowledge, you have enough if you're in Christ. Your story is enough, how you came to believe. John 3.16 is enough. Romans 6.23 is enough. Make sure that you have seed packed and ready. So we've just spoken about the scattering of the church. And with the scattering of the church, we're going to read about a couple men who were impacted by the scattering of the church. And the first man is a man by the name of Philip. And he's a servant of God. And another man named Simon, and he's a sorcerer. So let's look at the two differences between these two men. So let's begin with a man filled with the Holy Spirit by faith. Let's talk about Philip the deacon. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. And when the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. And what he said was this, Jesus Christ died on the cross and he rose from the dead and he is God Almighty. That's what he said. And for with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. And so there was great joy in that city. Now we have a second deacon who has healing power. He's driving demons out of people, and lame people are walking at the healing touch of Philip. So let's talk about who Philip is. Philip is just like Stephen. He was a fellow deacon. In our church, many of our ministry teams, we have co-leaders there are two co-leaders of the widow ministry team, Stephen and Philip. He was really good at feeding the widows in the church. That's what Philip did. He is full of the Holy Spirit. That's his power. He's full of wisdom, which comes from the Holy Spirit. He is the second deacon with healing power. And so if he has all this healing power, he's so great, why is he fleeing? Why is he running from Jerusalem? Is he, is he a coward? You know, if the, if, the, if the government comes against us someday, and they post signs at the front door, don't you dare come in here under arrest, what are we going to do? We're going to bust down the door and come in here? Or why, might we scatter into homes? We could. So Philip, I don't think he's a coward at all. I think he's using common sense. He's one, remember, he's one of those Hellenistic believers, those Hellenistic Christian believers like Stephen... He had Greek culture, a Greek voice. He wore Greek clothing. Guys, he had a target on his back. He's not pure Jewish. Let's go after them first. There's a good chance Philip had a most wanted poster with his face all over it. And so I believe Philip is scattering to another area, risk of death, and I think God's sending him for a reason. God's sending him on a mission. And here's what it is. Before the Apostle Paul, the greatest missionary of all time, will ever take one mission trip to the Gentiles, there's this man named Philip who's not much talked about. He will take the gospel to a very derogatory term of people, and he's taking the gospel to the half-breeds. Yeah, that's derogatory, but that's how the Samaritans were looked upon. Now, Samaria is a sandwich in between Judea to the south of Israel and Galilee to the north. Jesus up in Galilee, Jerusalem in the south, and Samaria in the middle. And so anytime somebody wanted to make a trip up to the Sea of Galilee for a vacation, you don't go through Samaria. You go around it. You know why? Because there's half-breeds in that, in that area. We don't want to, I don't even want to come in contact with them. The Jews hated the Samaritans. Uh, by the way, you want to know about the grace of God? Do you know who who lived in Samaria? John chapter 4, one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Yeah, the five-time divorcee lived in Samaria. The five-time divorcee that, that Jesus said, I have living water. The five-time divorcee was a half-breed who will be the first person on the planet to self tell someone else, Jesus is the Messiah. That's the grace of God. God is all about grace. It's not about favoritism. You know why Samaritans were half-breeds? Literally, 
because they had Assyrian blood running through them. During the captivity, the reign of the Assyrians in 722 B.C., they intermarried and intermingled. The Jews and the Assyrians became a half-breed nation. And therefore, the Jews hated them because they intermarried with, with people that worshipped pagan gods. Do you know that the Pharisees actually labeled Jesus as one of those Samaritans? In their big argument over whether Jesus was a god, the Pharisees said, aren't we right in saying that you're a Samaritan and demon-possessed? And so that's the culture of the Jewish people against the people living to the north in Samaria. And with that being said, guys, has anybody in here, have you ever felt like an outcast? Have you ever wore a label? I got one. I'm a divorcee. And I'm a preacher. There are some in this country who will say, this is wrong. And I say, grace of God. God loves the outcast. God is for the underdog. God is for all those who are one of those. If you feel like one of those, God is for you and with you. Thank you, Lord. And you know what Philip's going to be? He is first and foremost sent to proclaim Jesus as the Messiah to guess who? Outcasts, half breeds those looked down upon. That's why Philip is sent to Samaria. You know, and, and we sometimes forget that, that Stephen and both Stephen and Philip both performed miracles and wonders and signs, and those were awesome, but they were all performed, and the word, Bible says performed, so that people would hear the gospel. They weren't performed so that people could go, ooh, and oh, that's amazing. Look at that miracle. That's not why they were performed. Sunday morning worship, while you're here, is not a performance. We're not here, Johnny's not here, I'm not here, to perform for anybody. We're not here for oohs and ahs. We're here for the oohs and ahs to be unto Jesus. That's why we're here today, to worship and praise Christ. We're here to promote him and never to pro promote a man, ever. Secondly, for my engineering friends, Philip is sent to Samaria as an engineer. Yes, he is. He's actually sent as a bridge builder. Because what he's doing, he's going to try and attempt to build a bridge between Jewish believers and Samaritan believers. Those with different cultures, different backgrounds, different tastes, all the above. And really what Samaritans and Jews are, they are estranged cousins. That's what they are. Anybody, you got anybody in your family right now that is estranged, that's out of the family, that doesn't really contact you anymore? That's what these two groups of people are. And so God's going to try and build a bridge between the Jewish people, the Jewish believers, and the Samaritans. And he's got a bridge, and the bridge is Jesus Christ. There is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for, I think that says all people, not just good people, not just religious people, not just the Jews, not just the Samaritans, all people, atheists, agnostics, Muslims, all the above, all people, Jesus can be the bridge for. Do you know what the world needs today? You know, we live in a country of, of pure division. I just can't wait for 2024 to come around. I can't wait for the 2024 election. Who's ready for that? You know what's coming. Backbiting and gossip and division. This world needs more bridge builders. Who in this congregation, who's willing to enter, enter a, a hostile environment, a family squabble, a friendship squabble, and try and bridge two people together. Who's willing to, to help bridge broken lives together? The world needs more Phillips, bridge builders. This week, look for an opportunity. I guarantee you, there are some in here today that you're going to have the opportunity this week to build a bridge. Look for it and pray over it. And take seed with you. So, Philip... The second deacon to perform miracles. He's taken the gospel to the half-breeds of Samaria. He's contrasted by a man named Simon who actually wants to buy the power of God with money. There's a word for that. It's called simony. That's, that's an actual Webster dictionary word. It's from this man here. So let's read about him. A man named Simon had practiced 
sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people gave him their attention, and the people exclaimed, this man is rightly called the great power of God. Wow. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his what? Not his love, not his kind acts, but with his sorcery. He's dark. Here's what we know of Simon the sorcerer. Right there it is. He performs and practices sorcery. So what does that mean in the biblical times? Biblical sorcery is pretty much what it sounds like. It's a person using the dark occult, divination, illusions, trickery, and yes, drugs. Drugs were used in the time of Jesus. Our word for pharmacy comes from the Greek word pharmakai, which means sorcery. And so whatever, ma- whatever power Simon possessed, it was of Satan, and it was through lies and deceit and trickery and drug use. That's Simon. And you know why he's doing it. Money, money, money. That's why. Number two, before I get to that, you know, let me just say this real quickly, and I'm not trying to be judgmental on anyone. I'm not trying to crush your bubbles, but we have very popular mediums and spiritists in this world today, and psychics, right? You all know John Edwards and the crossover guy? Remember him? He's still around. Very wealthy. The Long Island medium, the blonde hair. They're funny, they're kind, they're hilarious. The Bible says that mediums will defile you. The Christian, the follower of Christ, you steer clear of mediums and psychics and the occult. It is is of Satan, and Satan is an angel of light. It can look glorious and majestic, so does Satan. Number two about Simon, he's full of pride. You know what? If Simon was alive today, Simon the sorcerer, you know who he'd be? He would be the selfie king. I'm the great power of God. Click, click, click. He'd have so many social media followers with Simon the sorcerer because he was full of himself. He relished his name, the great power of God. But guess what happened? His his bubble got busted. You know why? Because the gospel came in town. That's why. In comes Philip with the gospel. Christ crucified, Christ resurrected. Christ is God. Christ is the power with true light, not demonic light. And you know what happens? People start following Jesus. And Simon loses some of his people, and he's probably losing some of his money. But he's interested. Here's what gets really dicey. Very touchy subject today. We read this. Simon himself believed and was baptized. And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. Somehow, Philip, it says here, believed. Now, what's he believing? I don't know. It doesn't say. I'm assuming that he believed in Jesus, right? We have that in our culture today. You believe in Jesus, you go to heaven. You just believe in Jesus. Let me say this real clear. Satan believes in Jesus, and Satan believes that Jesus rose from the dead. And he is going to hell because he has never, ever surrendered. He's never repented. So, did Simon the sorcerer, did he get saved? Was he a true believer? Was he following Jesus or was he following Philip? Was he desiring the power of the miracles or was he desiring the power giver? Which which was it? Let's try and figure it out. Because the sad part is there are some people today in the world that will say, well, I believe in Jesus, I believed in him, I'm going to heaven, and then they go off on their merry way, and they never repented. And I don't want them to have a bad experience on the day of judgment. Well, I believed, and they left out repent. Here's what happens. News hits Jerusalem. The apostles are still there. The Samaritans come to believe in Jesus. Samaritans are getting saved. And thankfully, John and Peter have a spirit of grace right now. And they go up to Samaria, and they're going to continue this bridge-building adventure, and they lay hands on the new believers. The Jews, the Jewish apostles, now Christians, laid their hands 
on half-breed Samaritans. And you know what happens? There's a Samaritan Pentecost. It doesn't tell us what happens, but something visible happens. Do they pray in tongues? Maybe. But you know who's there? On this commissioning of these Samaritan believers, Simon the sorcerer, and he sees the power, and he sees the change, and he sees the signs, and he says, I want that power, $5,000. He's got his checkbook out. I want that. Peter and John, I want that power. I'll write a check for whatever you want. He tries to buy the power of God. He tries to buy the Holy Spirit. Simon believed and was baptized. Did he really believe? Acts 2.38 says, repent and be baptized. I don't know Simon's heart. Only Jesus does. For me, more than likely, no. He was a fake believer. No repentance. No changed life. No new creation. None of that happened. His faith appeared to me more centered on the miracle power than on the person of Christ, than on the forgiveness of Christ. We see no indication of a believing repentance. After being offered money for the Holy Spirit, Peter will say this, may your money perish with you. Repent of this wickedness. You're still a captive to sin. You're still, still being led by sin. You still follow sin. You're still following yourself. The word repent is usually reserved in the Bible for those who have not truly come to Christ. And if you read Simon's closing statement of the passage, he's not ready to follow Jesus. It's still about him. Pray for me so that nothing you've said may happen to me. It's still all about Simon. Hey, pray for me that maybe my business is restored. Pray that I don't go to hell. Just pray for me. Early church historians, Jerome, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, they write of a heretic named Simon who will wreak havoc on the church, and quite likely it is this same man, Simon the sorcerer. And what this is, guys, I had to bring it up, because, guys, I don't want anyone to miss the place of paradise. I don't want anybody to miss that, because you uh, made a false confession. You, you didn't know what you were doing. I did that when I was 13. I said, yeah, I believe in Jesus, get baptized, and I just lived my own life. I never truly repented. Simon the Sorcerer is just a sad story of a man so close to salvation, so close to salvation, yet not willing to truly repent and follow. As you plant seed, I hope you do, not all seed planted will produce a harvest. It's not up to you to bring someone to Christ. You're called to plant and you're called to water. That's all you're called to do. God's word will not return void. You're just to plant and you're to love people. And regardless of the soil, you're called to scatter seed. The word of God and the love of God. Johnny, come on up. I'm going to close with this in the praise band. Uh, from the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, we see what? We see intimidation. We see persecution. We see infiltration. We see death. We see beatings amongst the church, within the church. And there's one common theme that has run through the entire book of Acts so far. And here's what it is. The church grew through men and women who were filled and under the control of the Holy Spirit. That's how seed was scattered, under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Do you ask for the daily filling? Every believer is given the Holy Spirit upon your upon your birth in Christ. But there's a call to be filled to overflowing every day. Do you ask for that filling every day? Lord, Holy Spirit, fill me up to overflowing. I want you to influence everything that I say, think, and do today. Holy Spirit, here I am. Use me for the glory of God. Are you building relationships with your lost neighbor? Have you built that relationship? I'm telling you, every one of you have got a neighbor that doesn't know Jesus. Do they know you're a Cub fan, Cardinal fan, or do, do they know that you're a Jesus follower? Which one is it? You know, building relationships is not that hard. Guys, go ahead and go over and talk to your neighbor and talk about, hey, the Cardinals are in last place, the Cubbies are winning. Go ahead and talk about all that stuff. It's great. But are you going to plant a seed when it's time to plant a seed within the heart of your neighbor? That's a little harder to do. 
to have a conversation about Jesus. I don't know why, but it, apparently it is. You know, in the words of my brother Carl Raby, don't be afraid to do hard things. It's okay. You could be rejected. It's okay. You plant a seed. You have no idea what will happen later on in that person's life. You have this powerful, powerful force within you, and it's really a person. It's a person of the Holy Spirit. Be filled and influenced by him every day. You know, we, we, we began this series with these three words, pray, invite, testify. Uh, some of you have neighbors that you should be praying for. I, I would challenge every member of this church, get one or two people in your mind start praying for their salvation. I'm going to ask the students, I'm looking at high schoolers out there, start praying for some of your classmates that don't know Jesus. You're not out of the picture either. You have a big influence on the culture today. Start praying for the lost, inviting them into your life, and when it's time, guys, the time will come where well, you'll be able to tell them your story of the gospel. And be ready. Have seed ready. You are not responsible for another person's soul. You are not. But you are responsible to go. The altar is open today. Anybody wants to come up and, and pray for healing, we always will pray for healing up here today. Uh, if anyone wants to come up to the altar and praise God for a healing that's taking place, come forward and offer a, an, uh, a sacrifice of praise unto God today. And if you're questioning your salvation, I don't want anybody to question salvation. I don't want anyone to fear not going to heaven. And if you're thinking, man, I've never truly repented. I've never really said, Jesus, I'll follow you. I just sort of said, hey, I believe if you've never truly repented, come to the altar and get that settled now before it's too late. Come to the altar of grace.